going on with Professor Stephen Finney and his talk on the reversing of type 2 diabetes and its cardiovascular risks with a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Let's welcome Dr. Finney, Professor Finney. Thank you. It's great to be back in London, and even in the heat. Uh, this is kind of familiar territory for me because I grew up about 60 miles that way. Uh, and used to sail a 8 or 19 foot wooden boat on the Thames River here uh, back in the 1960s. So it feels kind of like home. So thanks for the opportunity to come back and do this. Um, what I want to do is jam. Somebody maybe I think uh, Richard made a comment about. Yeah, I'm going to need a lot more than half an hour. I'm going to try to jam a lot of information in 30 minutes here, and I'll be around the rest of the afternoon if people want to ask me questions about this after the talk. Um, so, uh, my <clears throat> goal is get to <clears throat> the work we're doing with type 2 diabetes and showing long-term safety and sustainability of a well-formed ketogenic diet. But I want to provide some interviewing background as well. Most important thing is I have a number of of conflicts, but the most obvious conflict is that I'm a, a founder and chief medical officer of Verta Health. Uh, the data I'm going to show you is from Verta Health. Uh, I'm obviously seriously conflicted about that, but all the data I'm going to show you is already published in the peer-reviewed literature. And that's my commitment is one of the things I do as a scientist, I don't go out, go out and try to prove myself right, I've set out to prove myself wrong. <clears throat> and I have managed to do that a number of times in the past. And, uh, but we'll see where the obesity, I'm sorry, where the Verta uh, process takes us. But just treat everything I say with skepticism because I'm biased. So <clears throat> I'm kind of preaching to the choir group, but as you, know, you all know, most physicians, both here, most healthcare professionals have been taught that uh, a ketogenic diet and nutritional ketosis are dangerous. Uh, in most textbooks of, of uh, Dietetics, they talk about, and even in some textbooks of medicine, though, they talk about ketones as being toxic byproducts of fat metabolism. Uh, and we've known for uh, over a century that's not true. Um, we've known for the last 60 years that, that ketones are an excellent fuel for the, the brain um, and uh, can be used by other parts of the body as well. But what's brand new, well, what's, what's recent over the last seven years, is we now understand that beta hydroxybutyrate is although it's only a very small molecule, about 100 um, uh, Daltons in weight, uh, that is, is a very potent uh, epigenetic signal. That is, it regulates certain, selectively regulates certain sets of genes in the body that alter the body's defense against oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, and what's really new, and you've never, probably not heard this before, that is that ketones are not just fuel, not just signals, but they can be made into polyester chains of varying length, and those polyester chains have structural functions in cellular metabolism and cellular uh, um, organelles such as calcium channels. And that's completely new, and we're just beginning to understand that there's actually three components to what ketones do. One is fuel, one is signaling, and one is actual pieces of the cell, structural pieces of the cell itself. So this is really exciting here. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jeff Bullock and I, uh, over the past few decades uh, have worked kind of hard to define the differentiation between uh, uh, the fed state where ketones are extremely low, uh, what we call nutritional ketosis, which we used to think started at 0.5 and went up to about 3 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, and the ketoacidosis really didn't begin, did, it didn't begin to affect the acid-base balance in the plasma until you got up above 10 millimolar. So the important distinction here is that if you eat bagels and orange juice for breakfast, your ketones are 0.1. Uh, there's a tenfold difference between that and going, getting into nutritional ketosis around one or so, maybe a little less. But then again, a tenfold difference between uh, nutritional ketosis and ketoacidosis. With this epigenetic, epigenetic signaling now, it's beginning to look like some of the epigenetic effects are happening down here. So uh, this is not a rigid, uh, this is, you know, educated guesses here, but we're learning the fine nuances about this uh, as we go forward. Uh, so the concept of nutritional ketosis, your physicians may not have heard of that unless you've educated them. Oh, by the way, I, I like the Dave Feldman showing that, the, you know, the people go online, learn something, and then they teach their doctors about that. And I have a name for that. I call that dogleg CME. 
And then it's, it, the information goes to the patient, and the patient takes a turn and brings it back to the doctor, as opposed to us trying to teach doctors. We teach the patients, and the patients teach, teach the doctors. Um, so I mentioned that uh, uh, ketones can be an epigenetic signal. Uh, and one of the things that they regulate uh, are the body's resp uh, inflammatory responses. And they regulate it typic typically in a positive, or you know, a beneficial way, which means nutritional ketosis down regulates inflammation. And I'll show you data on that in a later slide. Uh, but that's really important in the context of type 2 diabetes because we now understand, so this is a paper in 2011 uh, that hypothesized that type 2 diabetes is is an inflammatory disease, um, but this was considered pretty radical back then. But when somebody like Gerald Olesky at UC, uh, University of California in San Diego starts talking about it, this is in JCI in 2017, this has gone mainstream. We now realize that inflammation is an underlying driver of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. Uh, so we're getting much closer, I think, to the root cause of what's happening here. Um, and you know, insulin resistance is no longer a phenomenon we're beginning to look at as a process driven by changes in tissue uh, uh, compounds that are critical for insulin action. Uh, and as I mentioned, the epigenetic signaling stuff were, were papers published in Science in 2013, uh, and then uh, uh, other uh, papers, John Newman and Eric Verdon, these two gentlemen at UCSF and now at the Buck Institute, have been leaders in that, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, review, beta hydroxybutyrate, much more than the metabolite, meaning it does other things than just be a fuel, is now a highly cited paper. Um, so it, we're really on a swell of understanding the um, uh, metabolic, the much greater metabolic complexity of nutritional ketosis and its downstream effects metabolically. Um, as I mentioned, it, it, one of the things it does is it protects the body from inflammation. Uh, and when, key, when the mitochondria burn ketones, they make less of these things called reactive oxygen species uh, or free radicals. And so it, it, ketones, by generating less free radicals, generate less um, uh, uh, chemicals that damage polyunsaturated fats like arachidonic acid. So arachidonic acid is a omega-6 uh, polyunsaturate that is an essential component of all mammalian cell membranes. Uh, and having four double bonds is very prone to being damaged by reactive oxygen species. And when that happens, it makes a group of compounds called isoprostates. And depending on where that oxygen randomly attaches, you get different structures. But many of these isoprostate compounds are like prostaglandins. You'll see you've heard about prostaglandins like PGE2 that in some tissues of the body is pro-inflammatory. Well, these isoprostates that are close in structure to prostaglandins have the same effects. And so making a lot of this by ox reactive oxygen species damaging arachidonic acid leads to inflammation. And so uh, this is one of the pathways through which this happens. And I do want to take issue with a prior speaker that when that damage to, to these polyunsaturated fatty acids occurs, it's permanent. You can't undo that damage and make it back into an essential fatty acid. It can't be recycled. It has to be degraded uh, and cleared from the body. Uh, so these are very dangerous compounds. The less of them you make, the healthier you are. By the way, <clears throat> cigarette smoking increases the production of these by a factor of four. So we now have some, uh, another compound mechanism of why cigarettes are damaging, because they lead to increased ROS and greater membrane damage. Uh, and then the other way that beta hydroxy uh, butyrate affects inflammation is there are many, many different uh, mediators of inflammation throughout the, throughout the body. We call them biomarkers, but actually they're mediators. So C-reactive protein, which I'm sure you've heard about, is a mediator of inflammation, but we measure that as a biomarker. But even long before CRP, we had total white blood cells, white, white blood cell count, uh, and the, the more inflamed you are, the higher your white cell count is, but the <clears throat> damaging levels of, associated with white blood cell counts occur in what we used to call the normal range. So if we look at a, a value of this between four and a half and 10, we say, oh, that's normal. Uh, but anybody above five or six or seven uh, in the white cell count is, is associated with uh, uh, additional tissue damage. Uh, but those things are driven on or, or generally by assembling a multi-component thing called the NLRP3 inflammasome. 
And putting that, that together then has effects on multiple genes in your genome. That has, so you're regulating a cascade of events downstream. And beta hydroxybutyrate blocks the assemblage of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So you've actually got a, a, a component that is on average across a broad spectrum of biomarkers of inflammation, bringing up, turning the temperature of the whole system down to a more moderate level. Again, these are mechanisms that have just been discovered in the last probably three or four years. Does that actually happen in humans? Well, Jeff Wolick uh, and his team, I got to be a kind of a fly on the wall watching him and his team do this, they recruited um, uh, 40 people with metabolic syndrome, and half of them they put on a calorie-restricted, uh, low-fat, low high-carbohydrate diet. The other half they put on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, which they didn't have to calorie-restrict because the people, when they first started the diet, automatically reached the tidy before they uh, were consuming full calories, and so they were, both groups lost weight, one because they were restricting the others because they were in the initial phase of nutritional ketosis. We measured 14 different biomarkers of inflammation, and many of them came down in both groups because both groups were losing weight. But seven of the 14 came down significantly, to significantly greater degrees on the ketogenic diet compared to the uh, high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Uh, so the Although both groups were losing weight, the ketogenic diet was vastly superior in causing this that broad spectrum down regulation of infl inflammation biomarkers. Uh, in that same study, we also looked at all the biomarkers of uh, metabolic syndrome, and they're the ones outlined in green here. So visceral or abdominal fat, triglycerides, HDL, cholesterol, and glucose, and along with glucose insulin, uh, all of them improved to a much greater degree with the uh, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet than with a low fat calorie restricted diet. Uh, uh, and so uh, this uh, was a precursor to the study that was mentioned previously today, uh, where we uh, uh, actually held weight constant in people and put them on a very low carb diet, an intermediate carb, and then a high carb. So every person in the study did each of the three diets. And more than half of the subjects, nine out of 16, on the low carbohydrate diet, reverse their metabolic syndrome without weight loss. So this is a metabolic effect of, of altering macronutrient intake. It's not an effect of weight loss. Weight loss helps, but the primary driver here is getting the carbs down to each individual's, below each individual's threshold of carb tolerance to allow these beneficial, to some degree, fueling, but also metabolic signaling effects to kick in. So just very quickly, I want to kind of lay out our view of what we start with, with a quote, well-formulated ketogenic diet. There are many ways to do a ketogenic diet, and some of those weight ways work well. I'll also say, and I'm not gonna get into it, there's some ways of doing a ketogenic diet that have been advocated that don't work well. Uh, so not all, quote, keto is gonna show the same kinds of effects that I'll report to you here. Uh, but typically we use uh, protein in the range of 15 to 20% of daily energy expenditure. This is not intake macros, because your macros will change depending on where you are in the phase of starting out and losing weight versus getting to a weight stable point later on, which I'll show in the next slide. Uh, but we include uh, 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 non-starchy vegetables, and the primary reason to do that is to provide a source of additional potassium, and there's some fiber in that as well. Um, uh, and we in include nuts and seeds, uh, uh, dairy, uh, and again, you, there are various variations of elimination from this. Uh, I know there are concerns around oxalate and kidney stones, so you know, for, if you have a family history or a history of that, you, know, you want to take out the spinach, you want to take out the nuts, um, uh, and other oxalate component, containing components. But this is where we start with before we, we go do further elimination on an individualized basis. And when you do that in people who are overweight, have weight to lose, uh, and you have them eat a well-formulated diet, ketogenic diet to satiety. And in this case, what we're uh, using a tip an example of about 90 grams of protein, which is 360 calories, um, 30 grams of carbohydrate, which is 120 calories. And when you have people eat fat to satiety, most of them undereat and burn body fat when they initiate the diet. But as many of you probably have experienced over time, your natural instincts say, eat more. And what we have to work very hard to do in counseling our patients is when their appetite is telling them, oh, eat some more, they need to eat more as fat 
not as more carbs or not as more protein. And so as one progresses from initial uh, 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 adaptation of the diet and the weight loss and one reaches uh, a tapering of weight loss and then to weight stability, we try to hold the protein constant. We may add additional, a little bit of additional carbs, but the major change in macronutrient intake is in, in eating fat to satiety. And we don't prescribe fat calories. We tell people to trust your instincts. Eat the fat to satiety. We had enough stop. Uh, and that's the kind of natural phenomenon of how this works when we, we use this in this way. So getting into diabetes, what we're doing with type, uh, a low-carb diet and type 2 diabetes is absolutely not new. Before there was insulin, the only treatment for anybody with diabetes in those days, you know, before 1920, they couldn't ask, do an assay to find out if they had type 1 or type 2. Um, uh, and so there, there was basically a practice of, of low-carb and ketogenic diets for anybody who had sugar in their urine. And that worked so, pretty well for some people. And then insulin came along and the whole process was, this whole process was rendered, or sent to the scrap heap. And I want to credit Dr. Bruce Bisprian, who, full disclosure, was my mentor when I did my PhD. And Bruce did a study uh, uh, at MIT, back when MIT was doing human research. Uh, and he took a group of seven people with type 2 diabetes and he brought them into the metabolic research ward where they were basically in a diet prison. And he fed them uh, varying amounts of protein with virtually no carbohydrate. Uh, and he was experimenting to find how much protein people needed to preserve lean body mass. Uh, and so he was measuring nitrogen excretion and cumulative protein balance. But what I want you to focus on up here is this is the blood glucose when they started, up about 300. And this is a woman who was taking, uh, what was it, 40 units of of uh, regular insulin and 12 units of NPH, so a total of 52 units of insulin per day, and her blood sugar was in the 300s. She was very poorly controlled on insulin. And when he added the carbohydrate, or took away the carbohydrate and was giving her a very low calorie, very low protein diet, you could see her blood glucose plummeted, and he had to rapidly withdraw her insulin. And, it, and in 19 days, he had to completely off of insulin. Uh, and her weight plateaued to some degree when he got her off insulin, and then as she adjusted, the group, I'm sorry, their glucose plateau, and then started coming down more. Her weight came down progressively uh, over this 40-day period of time. Um, and uh, he repeated this as an inpatient process in six other patients. Um, now, so in five, uh, five out of the six were inpatients, one patient who had very mild diabetes, uh, in, uh, that person was an outpatient. But he did this as an inpatient um, project because A, it hadn't really been experimented in, in the modern era, and the other is that you've got to withdraw the insulin very quickly when your blood sugar starts plummeting, otherwise you're going to put people at high risk of, of hypoglycemia, which can be uh, dangerous to the point of, of causing death. Uh, and so this was done in, in basically a metabolic ward setting, uh, and uh, five of the seven uh, maintained a significant degree of weight loss after 12 months and remained free of the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Now, this was hidden in plain sight in the journal Diabetes. So when the American Diabetes Association subsequently said that, you know, there's, there's no, no uh, way to reverse this chronic progressive disease, this was sitting there in plain sight and, and being ignored. Uh, so that was back in 1976. Uh, but there was very little done with this. Eric Westman and Will Yancey published a paper in 2003 along with Mary Vernon where they uh, demonstrated a similar uh, sort of response uh, in people who were less severely diabetic. Uh, but I think this paper by uh, Gunter Bowden and the group at Temple University in Philadelphia, they published this paper uh, in 2005 uh, in which they took 10 people with type 2 diabetes, quite severe type 2 diabetes, again with poorly controlled blood sugar on medication. Uh, so this is blood sugar up here while they're eating a, 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 a standard American diet. And he was giving them the opportunity in the metabolic world to go to a buffet, kind of like what you had today. I mean, if you could decide how much bacon, how much of the cheese rice, how much of the, the cheeseburger you wanted to eat. And people ate to satiety and they ate about 3,100 calories a day, and their diabetes remained poorly controlled. Uh, and then after a week, he switched them to a, a uh, buffet-style, very low-calorie diet, uh, where they basically put out the foods that had uh, the very little carbohydrate. And they maintained that diet for two weeks, and they again ate to satiety, and they cut their caloric intake from 3,100 down to 2,100 calories per day, spontaneously. They did lose about two kilograms of weight in that two weeks of time. 
But what was astounding was this is the blood sugar curve over the course of the day. This is a 25-hour span here. After just two weeks of the ketogenic diet, remember that 5.5 um, millimolar is normal blood glucose, and this, and this is their fasting value. Uh, and just after two weeks, they went from being severely hyperglycemic to being essentially normal glycemic throughout the day. Uh, and during this time, in this, the first part of, this, the, of the week when they just started the ketogenic diet, they withdrew the majority of their diabetes medications. And this is published uh, in the mainstream medical journal, uh, and again, didn't generate a whole lot of fanfare because it was essentially orthogonal, completely opposite to what all, all of us had been taught. Uh, the other thing that's remarkable about this data is the, oops, the curve down here at the bottom is blood insulin level. These are the insulin levels while they're eating the high carbohydrate diet, and then you can see insulin levels fall as they adapted to the ketogenic diet. I'm sorry, this is over the course of, I'm sorry, over the course of the day. The blue is just after two weeks of the ketogenic diet, and they're getting much better blood glucose control with much less insulin which means they had to have become more insulin sensitive. But people won't, don't want to believe that, so they did what's called a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, where they plug an IV in one arm, pumping the insulin. In the other arm, they pump in glucose to keep their blood sugar normal so they don't die of hypoglycemia. The more sugar you put in is an indicator of increased insulin sensitivity, and that's the gold standard for measuring insulin sensitivity. And insulin sensitivity increased, improved by 75% in just two weeks. So when people say, oh, the benefits are, are weight loss, it doesn't matter what diet you eat, as long as you lose weight, you get the benefit. Not true. This is the benefits happen, and then the weight loss occurs. So it fits with what uh, Richard sitting in the front row here is. Got it right? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with this is that you have to remove the medication so quickly when this happens, when you go from this glucose curve to that glucose curve. Uh, when if the insulin levels are you know, a drop, and yet the blood sugar is dropping even faster, you've got to withdraw those medicines promptly. And the reason this is a metabolic work study is that Dr. Bowden and the IRB uh, committee agreed this could only be done in an inpatient basis. But that's a problem because it's extremely expensive and it's very short term. Uh, and so I'll just say, and I say this semi-seriously, uh, about five years ago, Jeff Bullock and I, who'd written a chapter in a book entitled The Treating Type 2 Diabetes and Carbohydrate Intolerance, a um, Silicon Valley, very successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur who himself was, had, had developed pre-diabetes while being a world-class endurance athlete, came to us and said, I understand that my diet's wrong. I figure you guys got this right. I think you should put, roll this out to people with diabetes, but you'll never turn the... the, the epidemic back by doing it in in-person standard medicine. He said, I want to help you with the technology so, you, so we can do this safely in our patients. And his name is Sami Inkinen, and his medical background, he was trained in nuclear engineering in Finland. Uh, so the science is what I just showed you, but what makes this applicable in a scalable way is a technology where we can provide what we call remote continuous care and essentially do the in, inpatient quality monitoring and med management as outpatients. And the way that's done is the patient is assigned a coach and given an app on a, a smartphone or a tablet or their computer. The coach talks to the patient through the app with either text, they can also do video conferencing. Uh, the coach is, is linked to one of our physicians, and we have specially trained physicians who manage the patient's diabetes and hypertension medications, and they interact with the patient. Uh, the patients get content to tell them what to do and why to do it. They get to watch videos of some old guy in a blue shirt talking in, in their phone. Uh, they monitor ketones and glucose by finger stick. They have a cell phone connected scale. They stand on it every day, and that weight data is automatically uploaded in, into the app, and they and we can track that continuously. And they have a social support group um, of other patients for peer teaching and support. Um, and by doing this, uh, our goal was to be able to safely uh, and efficiently administer a well-formulated ketogenic diet to a population of people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and I'll tell you that we published a number of papers on this. The, the two that are, are probably the most relevant are uh, our one-year data in terms of changing you know, uh, diabetic parameters. Um, and then 
we published a second paper focusing on the cardiovascular disease risk factors uh, and how those changed over a one-year period of time in these patients. Uh, at the end of the previous, this after a few more slides, I'll show you some of our two-year data as well. But I want to focus on the one-year data. Uh, so this study was done in Lafayette, Indiana, in conjunction with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. I don't think she needs any introduction. If you haven't seen her TED talk, you'll be probably the person <coughs> 5 million 522 who sees that, that TED talk. Uh, it's been an, an amazing 18 minutes of education for a lot of us, including a lot of physicians. So we recruited 262 people with type 2 diabetes, a smaller group that had um, pre-diabetes for our intervention. And then we recruited close to 100 people in the same community being treated in the same medical facility uh, who uh, remained on a standard dietary approach and standard of care diabetes treatment. Um, uh, the average age was 54. Their mean BMI was quite heavy at 41. Um, and here's an important fact. Their mean duration of diabetes was 8.4 years. Many of the other diabetes reversal studies that have been published recently have been done in populations of people who were recent onset, who are, have, have not had the cumulative uh, negative effects of, of long-term diabetes. Uh, and that's a very important group to treat. The earlier you get a person with diabetes and get them on this type of approach, the better the response. These are the harder patients to treat. And Dr. Hallberg, as you can imagine, loves to take care of the harder patients. Um, can I see what's going on here? Yes, this is uh, the first question is, yeah, we're told nobody can stay on this kind of diet. Our retention at one year was 80, what does that say, 84%? Yeah, 83. Um, which is remarkable for a, uh, a lifestyle change intervention. Um, so A, we had excellent retention at one year. Um, the other, other is, well, nobody can stay on a ketogenic diet for long, and we're proud of this. We, they're measuring their ketones daily for the, about the first uh, four or five months, and then two or three times a week for the last part of that year. Uh, and they, the, the group on average got up a little bit above 0.6 millimolar. Remember, these are people with, on average, long-standing type 2 diabetes and the most difficult patients because of their insulin resistance to get into ketosis. And if you take 0.5 as the kind of cutoff, you can see that they don't cross the 0.5 line on average until they get up to eight months. And even after one year, they're at 0.4 millimolar. So this is gratifying adherence on our part, or, you know, from our perspective. Uh, uh, so we had, you know, market in, in, uh, in, uh, retention and adherence. This is what happened to medications. All the dark blues here are meds that have been stopped, and the light blues of meds are reduced. Um, uh, and uh, the ones that were uh, not, uh, I'm sorry, were increased uh, are in the light brown, and to the extent there was anything that was, was added new, it's in the dark brown. Uh, and our goal was to get people off of sulfonylureas and down or off of insulin as much as possible because these are the two medicines that are most associated with uh, medication-induced hypoglycemia and, and risk of hypo, severe hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic symptoms. Uh, but you can see we reduced other meds as well. Um, the DPP-4s, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, we, we didn't change very much on average. Um, uh, GLP-1s, again, slight, used a little bit more because we were using the GLP-1s a bit to, to get people off of insulin, and we did not change metformin because metformin is no longer a diabetes drug. It's a, to some degree effective in people with diabetes, but it's a demonstratively effective in preventing diabetes to occur or recur, and we felt it would be inappropriate to take people off a drug for people who had just recently had diabetes and the only thing standing between them and diabetes was their diet. But again, the effect here was we removed about 55% of the medication burden for these patients, and most of that occurred in the first month. So what was the result? Uh, this shows the hemoglobin A1C. The mean value started at 7.5. On my, another slide, it says 7.6, because when we made the slides, we, the, the, the design person made the slide, uh, all, uh, rounded it up or down, because it was, in one case, it was 7.55. So if you see a 7.6, it's not that we're cheating. It's just that um, you could have gone either way and flip a coin. Uh, at, um, you can see most of the improvement occurred in the first three months, long before they, they lost all their weight, all the weight that they lost. And at one year, they were down at 6.2. So it's a 1.3 reduction in hemoglobin A1C. And once you get under 6.5, you're no longer qualified for the diagnosis of 
type 2 diabetes if you're off your diabetes specific beds. And this is our approach. We never tell people to restrict calories. They restrict carbs starting at the 30 grams per day or less, total carbs. We have them eat protein in moderation and eat fat to satiety. And this is what happens to weight when people are eating to satiety. And that graph I showed you with the four phases before kind of artificially uh, segregates out a continuum of where people, uh, over time, their natural instincts tell them, you know, you've, you've, you've lost quite a bit, let's stop losing. And we don't know why that occurs. But I will tell you that inflammation is known to affect the hypothalamus and interferes with the hypothalamus uh, recept receptors that uh, receive the signal of, the, of satiety from the rest of the body. So inflammation in the body is a, a uh, blocks satiety. Um, so, and I showed you what we did with inflammation in the, the previous short-term study with Dr. Bullock's group. Now, I always want to show bad things first. And so when people say, yeah, you can go on this diet, uh, but your cholesterol is skyrocketing. And it's true, some people, so this shows LDL cholesterol, calculated LDL from the Friedewald equation, which of course can be significantly flummoxed by broad changes in triglyceride level. So we basically separated the patients out in terms of uh, LDL decreasing 30%, more than 30%, uh, 20 to 30%, et cetera, no change at all, and then increases. And you can see that many people had marked improvements in their LDL, calculated LDL, but some of them had significant increases, and including some of them had very dramatic increases in LDL cholesterol, which is worrisome. And if LDL was the only factor that determined coronary risk, we wouldn't be doing this anymore. Because I don't want to do people harm. But this is a graph of whatever we have here. I think it's 14 other biomarkers of, of uh, coronary, cardiac, coronary disease risk. And uh, if the bar is to the left, that's the proportion of patients who, whose parameter got worse. And if it's to the right in dark blue, it's the ones that got better. And all the ones with the uh, blue star here are uh, ones who achieve significance, uh, statistical significance, and you've heard of like 0.01 or 0.001, and again, I'm a grumpy old man, I said let's use a value of 10 to the minus 6. What that means is one in a million chance that that would happen randomly as opposed to it being a treatment effect. And you can see from almost all of those, the beneficial effects are there. Including the fact that the, when you break down LDL into different particle sizes, the small, dense ones are the ones that are most damaging. And when the LDL particles, they're still LDL, but they're bigger and more poignant, they no longer cause damage. Uh, and you can see that the small, dense LDL, uh, 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 was significantly improved in, in the majority of patients. Um, and then LDL size means they get bigger, significantly improved. So the, the idea that LDL is a be-all and end-all of risk, it you know, should have been buried a long time ago. It persists because it's simple and it, it comes into every uh, you know, standard blood lipid panel. We need to get beyond that. Uh, and now let me just finish up by mentioning that uh, we published our two-year data about uh, um, uh, six weeks ago uh, in the Journal of um, uh, Endoc uh, Frontiers in Endocrinology. Uh, and then we'd also presented at Obesity Week last fall and actually had few, few people were throwing tomatoes at us. Um, when we did that. Um, anyway, uh, so this is in the main, this has been published in, in the peer-reviewed literature. This shows, now I'll show you for the first time, this is our usual care group, and their hemoglobin A1C stub is 7.5 and rose slowly progressively over two years, and that's, this is a chronic progressive disease in action, the black line. The blue line is, I've showed you this data, I apologize, this says 7.6 and the yellow one says 7.5, big deal. This is the initial response. This is the end of, of one year uh, with a, a 1.3 reduction. And we had a 0.2 increase, I'm sorry, 0.3 increase over the course of the year. But out here, we still had a 1% unit reduction in hemoglobin A1C at, at two years. So this is not perfect. Uh, it's good. I want it to be better. But there is no other study that has shown that degree of persistence of benefit with any degree of carbohydrate restriction, uh, and particularly now with this degree of med reduction. And we had 
the same meds or less being used here at the, at the two year period. So we were not adding back meds in this process. And again, the weight was, reduction was remarkable. We had lost 35 pounds. They gained back about five pounds in two years. Uh, again, uh, uh, one of the things that's taught us is this is not a one year treatment. <laughs> Our program really has to be, for most patients, a persistent. And we maintain the program uh, out here in two years, but we have to get better at what we offer the people in terms of, of long term maintenance, because this is not easy. But it shows that for many, if not most patients, this is eminently possible. My clicker is no longer advancing. But I have one more slide. Anyway, uh, let me just summarize by saying that uh, doing a well-formed ketogenic diet and doing it right and ma making it last, make making it persist, Oh, okay, this is hard to do, but what we demonstrated is it's possible to do, and we demonstrated it's possible to do it safely in an outpatient environment with some of the most complex cases of type 2 diabetes. Um, so the cons are um, that we have to do this with very close monitoring of, of their glucose and their, glu and their hypoglycemic med and the adjustment of hy hypoglycemic medications. And frankly, most doctors, practicing physicians, are uncomfortable doing this because they don't have any practice in it. They never had to do it. You always add a Normax, so you didn't take them away. Uh, and so this really takes a certain degree of, of specialty training for physicians to do this. And it's not something that most physicians, you know, general practitioners and family, or, or internal medicine, even endocrinologist doctors want to do. Uh, and so one has to make sure that the, the patient actually has access to this expertise as opposed to saying, oh, yeah, talk to your doctor and see what he or she says you should do about that. And it's essential to have this tight loop monitoring. Um, uh, and I, I will also say that, you know, we want to see what this does at five years. So we've extended this program, so the product project. So now we're, we're collecting 3.5 year data now and a year and a half from now we'll begin collecting our five year data on this, this study. Uh, but the bottom line is this is possible to do, it's hard, but what we've demonstrated to our customers and our the customers for this that we're now offering commercially are predominantly self-insured employers. And I didn't show you the financial data, but we can demonstrate to the, our, these, the employers that for their, their general population of employees who have the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, if they offer this program to their employees for free, we save the employer more money in one year than our program costs. So, you know, when we went into this, Jeff Wolf and I said our, our goal here is to save lives and save money, and I think we're on the path to doing that. Thank you.